A while back, someone made a request for a story in our What If Naruto Trained Under All Three Sanin video. Their request said, and I quote, Hey Amagi, I understand you probably won't see this, but I have an idea for a what if. I remember Obito talking about the Nine Tails and how Minato could have saved Obito if he noticed it was him. What if Minato realized it was Obito and brought him back during the Nine Tail attack? End quote. Here at the Amagi, we value all of our viewers and their opinions. While not every request becomes a video, we take a lot of inspiration from your comments and requests. We love getting feedback, and yes, we do see your comments, and it warms our hearts every time. And so, because I feel that this request has a lot of story potential, I plan to make it for you special. I hope you enjoy this. Thanks, Voting Clover! Welcome to the Amagi! Before we begin, we publish a new video every day, so be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. We know that a lot of you folks like to watch our videos as you do keep coming back, but if you could double check that you were subscribed to the Amagi, it would mean the world to us. The Amagi's reach stretches beyond just this channel, so if you're a fan of us, please consider subscribing to our other channels and following us on all of our social media. Help us reach our goal of passing 100,000 followers on all of our accounts by the end of the year. And let's get going. Oh, this pain, the voice within him spoke. His inner voice was the only one that could be heard by this point as his physical voice was crushed under the weight of the stone. He felt his body breaking. He felt like his bones were being ground to dust and for all he knew, they were. In between bouts of unconsciousness, he heard the sound of fighting, screaming, crying. He heard the voice of Kakashi and lightning style chakra as he rushed through the hordes of Iwanin. Please protect Rin, he said as he finally lost consciousness. He was floating in the void. He was in total darkness, complete deprivation of his senses. There was nothing for him to feel, nothing for him to see or hear. There was only Obito, curled into a ball in his own inner world. His mind, where his tired and scared psyche had retreated to, he sat there. Was he dead? Was this death? Why did it feel so cold? Had he really gone to hell? What did he do to deserve this? Was it because he killed that Iwanin? Was he forever separated from God and his loved ones because of murder? Or was it envy? Envy of his friends? Envy of Kakashi? Suddenly there was this feeling, there was something else to sense. And for the first time since arriving here, he saw his own hand as it raised to block out the light. Are you God? The voice then spoke. Some might call me a God. Obito looked into the light and saw only an eye bearing rings moving out from the center. The light grew and suddenly he was here. He was in a bed, the entire right side of his body having been covered and bandaged. He could see. It was a little foggy and a little blurry. Perhaps there had been damage done to his eye after the rocket smashed it. He was seeing double, but slowly his eyesight mended. He was confused at that, but what he was even more confused about was his own survival. He felt pain in his body, but not as severe as it had been. A phantom pain of something long gone. He looked down and found his torso was wrapped up, but his legs weren't. One leg was a paler shade of white than the other. Powder? Was he coated in some medicinal powder? No. He moved his foot and saw how gelatinous it was. He almost panicked, but a worse panic came over him when he saw the two creatures standing over him. He let out a cry of terror, a scream for his life. He was too weak to fight back, and after what he had gone through, the honor of a shinobi was a memory in the back of his head, a memory that didn't matter anymore to him. Not now. He couldn't defend himself. He screamed in terror and attempted to flee, only to feel as if a million burning daggers had been stabbed into his right side. He screamed again, but this scream was one of intense agony. This brought tears to his eyes. Don't move, a gruff voice spoke, commanding, not asking. The same voice that pulled him from the darkness. He looked over as the creatures backed away. He saw an elderly man there wearing a gown, his hair white as snow, sitting upon a stone throne before a massive statue. In his hand, he held a scythe. Obito spoke. You're not a god, you're the Grim Reaper. The man looked up with a smile. Yeah, I've been called that too. Obito seemed like he wanted to run, but with a single movement, his body flat out denied him, refusing to move further as the pain had already taught his subconscious the penalty of obeying that order in this condition. The old man's face grew a bit more serious. As I said before, do not move. Obito looked around, his neck on a swivel, the only part of him that he could move without pain. Where am I? Who are you? The old man sighed, not because he was unwilling to speak, but because he was trying to gather what little energy remained within him just to utter words. Some have called me a god of shinobi. Others have called me a reaper of souls. But these days, I am but a ghost. I am the ghost of the Uchiha. And this is my abode, the mountain's graveyard. After all, it's only fitting for a ghost of the past to make their abode in a lichyard. 
Obito's mind was on fire, trying to pin it, not yet aware that he was out of danger. Ghost of the Uchiha? Wait, there's no way. You can't be. Madara Uchiha? The man questioned, finishing Obito's sentence. I am. Obito seemed to clam up a little, realizing just who he was looking at. At that time, Obito saw not the old man who required life support just to breathe, but instead saw the legend. What do you want with me? Madara continued to sit there, his pilfered Sharingan glowing in the shadows cast by the hair hanging over his face. I've been watching you for a long time. I've been searching for an heir to my dream. I can trust nobody but you. To say that Obito was confused was to say that the moon was round or that fire was hot. Why me? I don't even know you. Madara smiled. Because I see in you a gentle heart as fragile as glass. You're someone who cares and you're someone who wants what's best for everyone and my dream will bring peace to the world. Obito looked around, and what if I refuse? What if I refuse to accept? Madara's smile turned into a cold, hardened stare. Then I'll take your Sharingan and dispose of you. Now rest. I have need of you, and you cannot be of use to me until you're healed. So rest now, then we'll break you into your new body. So for two weeks, Obito rested constantly, barely moving to do anything, all while he was receiving the regenerative factor of Hashirama's cells, which now made up close to half of his body. But after those two weeks, he was ready to move and possessed no pain. He had to relearn how to do a lot of things. He had to relearn how to walk, how to hold things in his hands. It took a lot of trial and error, but he slowly became used to his new body and was capable of moving. Then came physical training to regain all the strength his body lost during the time he was inactive, as well as to condition his new body into a useful state that he could use for his many coming missions. He grew stronger, a little taller, and the hope of seeing the one girl he loved the most in the world lit a fire within him that pushed him to greater heights, pushed him to become more than he was. He may have been wounded, he may have been disfigured, but he loved her still and he wouldn't stop until he could find her again. And when he did, he would be stronger than ever before. He seemed more daring, his movements swifter. It was only to be expected, however. For all intents and purposes, Obito was now half Hashirama, so it would be expected that he should display even a portion of the old Hokage's power. He grew stronger, more powerful. It was then, however, that Zetsu rushed in with dire news. Rin and Kakashi are in trouble! Of course, this always was the plan. Madara knew that the only way to bring him onto the right path was to manipulate him, to make him hurt, to make him feel pain, to force him through the curse of hatred and watch the birth of a new being completely removed from anything it had ever been before. And so he let Obito go, who was determined to never return. But as he passed through the rain, he continued to see visions of things as he grew closer. By the time he arrived, he witnessed Rin impaled on the other end of Kakashi's arm. Rin, he cried out as suddenly Kakashi fell unconscious. Obito gripped his own head and fell into the tree. He would then open his eye to show the distinct look of the Mangekyo Sharingan. Blood began to drip from his eye as he cried out towards the heavens, his roar a direct challenge to fate. This drew the attention of all those nearby. Obito looked down, reborn through the flames of pain and hate. The zetsu he wore as a protective shell then closed around his face, leaving only his mongekyo exposed. He rushed through the trees. Spikes and all manner of piercing objects rose from the ground and fired on those from above. Blood splattered upon his face as his own eye began to bleed from usage. But with each use, with each movement it was damaged, it would heal even stronger due to Hashirama's cells. A Sharingan to surpass the eternal Mangekyo, a Sharingan born of Hashirama's healing factor, an eye that grew stronger with use, and he used it a lot. Attacks phased through him as if he didn't exist, as if he had become the embodiment of the term Ghost of the Uchiha. This was all according to Madara's design, and as Obito slaughtered the last of the Kirinin, he stopped by Rin and Kakashi. He knelt down by Rin and took her up in his arms. She was his everything. She was his life, his light. He would have sacrificed everything for her. He would have been crushed, killed, tortured, and resurrected a thousand times over if she would only smile upon him. In this moment, he wanted to die, and perhaps a part of him did. He uttered her name only once as he rose. His eye turned to Kakashi, filled with ire. He saw the blood on his hands, Reen's blood. You lying bastard! You lying bastard! He straddled his former friend and gripped the unconscious boy tightly around the throat. He squeezed tighter and tighter. He wanted to hear it. He wanted to hear his larynx break. He wanted to feel his windpipe crushed in the palms of his hands. He wanted to hear his neck snap. 
He squeezed tighter and tighter, but suddenly he stopped. Why did he stop? Why? He stood and stepped away from Kakashi and looked down on him. He ran into the forest where he stopped by a tree. Leaning against it, he lost composure and began to cry. Suddenly he looked at the sky, toward the rain falling on his face, and let out a cry of rage and frustration. It would be then that Obito would officially take up Madara's dream. Madara would show him all that he had planned, and he would show him his dream and why he fought, vowing that in this new world he could be with Rin. Madara would then remove himself from life support and would fall over dead. Obito was the only one left. He began to set things in motion. Now, it wasn't too long from now that Minato and Kushina would be informed of their baby's conception. A happy Minato would look to Kakashi who had since joined the Anbu, and he would feel a touch of sorrow, a bit of sadness. Kakashi had lost both of his friends, he'd lost his father. He was alone, all alone, and for a while Minato feared that Kakashi would be unable to handle it. He feared that Kakashi had lost sight of the meaning of life. He had grown reckless, merciless to his enemies, and self-destructive. He worked non-stop. He was a model Anbu agent, but he was pushing himself too far, and Minato began to believe that he was trying to get himself killed. So he ordered his only living student to watch Kushina as she went about her life. Kushina truly did require someone to watch over and protect her, but it could have been anyone. Perhaps one of the many agents always watching her, but no, they chose Kakashi. She would take the young boy out to eat, to the grocers, anywhere she liked to go, and anywhere that she thought he might like to go. Despite her best efforts though, he seemed to remain distant and uninterested. Such a tough nut to crack, but she couldn't expect anything else. Kakashi had walled off his heart. Nothing was getting in or out, and despite being in a village full of people and potential friends, he refused everything. Friendship, brotherhood shared between Anbu agents, the care of his Hokage and the Kage's wife, Kakashi might as well not even be here. He might as well be on the battlefield. He only spoke when spoken to and his answers were always short and direct. She hated to admit that Minato's plans seemed to be failing. Time continued to pass and she grew in size as the baby inside her got closer and closer to birth. Eventually, the day came where she would give birth and she'd been moved to another location for safety. The person now known as Toby, as his former self died with Rin, watched this from afar. The moment he learned that Kushina was pregnant, he knew this moment was coming. Now, could he really put the Ninetales into the ghetto statue at this moment? No, he actually couldn't. There was an order to things. But how could he pass up the chance to get the most powerful beast in all of the world? With this, he could easily get the other eight without so much as a sweat. The power of the Ninetales far exceeded the other tailed beasts. It was almost comical how unfair the Sage of Six Paths had been while dividing the power amongst the other beasts. You could tell who his favorite was, and now Obito would take it for himself. He would take the Ninetales, destroy the remnants of this accursed village, and then seal the Ninetales up into his Kamui realm, where he would leave it in a constant state of euphoria via Genjutsu. So he made his way in. He passed by the Anbu, slaughtering them as he moved past. He made his way into the facility. He would wait until just after the child's birth before making his move. He needed to strike before Minato could reinforce the seal. He would also need to separate Kushina and Minato. This shouldn't be too hard as the baby would be the perfect bargaining chip. Things were just falling so perfectly into place. He waited for his moment before he walked in, killed the nurses, and took the baby for himself. All the while, Minato was attempting to put the seal back on. Step away from the Jinchuriki, fourth Okage, he demanded as his hand rested just above the infant's soft and fragile skull. All it would take is a simple squeeze and it was over. Obito knew that, and Minato did as well, which is why Minato complied. Kushina struggled to hold the Ninetales in as the seal was failing. Toby would throw the baby into the air as to stab it with Minato grabbing the child before it could fall. But that was the plan all along. The baby had paper bombs glued to it. In a moment of fatherly instinct, Minato would remove the swaddling and immediately teleport out via flying Raijin as the cloth exploded into flames. This left Obito alone with Kushina. She was unable to talk at the moment due to the pain and loss of sealing. He put his hand on her and used Kamui to teleport her out. He then began the process of chaining her to the altar, the altar of his ambition. As the chains clicked around her wrists, she looked up. What are you doing? She asked. She looked weakly into his eye. She was startled. Despite the man's talk, there was something in his eyes. A glint of a heart in pain. A look that suggested somewhere deep in his heart, there was a part of him that hated every second of this. He took his hand and placed it on her seal, using her chakra to pull the beast out. But as he tugged, he felt the power of the beast. 
He also remembered that doing this would kill the Jinchuriki. He let go suddenly, letting the chakra return to within her. He gripped his hand as if it had been seared by the heat, but in all actuality, he was looking down at it as if to ask if he could handle staining it with this blood. Kushina sat there for a moment, her eyes widening a little. Upon taking the chakra back into herself, she brought with it a portion of the man's chakra, and it was chakra that she had felt before. He looked back at her as she looked to him through eyes filled with shock and terror. Obito! He recoiled as she said his name. She spoke again. How are you alive, Obito? And why are you doing this? He stood silently. She spoke once more. Take off that damn fool mask. And what do you think you'll see if I do? He asked. The face of my husband's student, she said with surety in her voice. Toby grabbed his mask for the moment and pulled it away to show his scarred and disfigured visage. Does this look like the face of the student you knew so long ago? He asked her, his voice having given up on impersonating a dead man. She gasped when she saw his face. Obito, are you okay? He sneered. Okay, I'll never be okay again. Not until I complete your mission. If you need medical treatment, we can treat you. Is someone promising to heal you if you do this for them? Obito scoffed. My wounds run far deeper than the surface, and your doctors can do nothing to heal my broken heart. No doctor can. She listened. Reen, she spoke. Your loss of Reen, that's eating away at you. He stood there silently. She spoke. Obito, Reen is dead. Killing me won't bring her back. Obito waggled a finger. No, you see, that's where you're wrong. I have a way to bring her back to me. W what is it? Kushina asked. I suppose only time will tell. You think I plan to spoil the ending for you? No, I need your tailed beast. And once I have it, I plan to be with Reen again. He put his hand on her seal again and gripped on with his chakra. As he got a good grip on it, his face seemed to show a bit of sadness, realizing that he was about to kill the woman he had always seen like a mother. She looked into his tearful eye. You don't have to do this. I don't know what anyone said to you about bringing Reen back to life, but I can promise you that they're lying. You don't have to do this. He looked up at her as a tear dripped down his cheek. You're wrong. I do. He pulled. Kushina let out a scream as suddenly the chakra of the Ninetales exited her body. Placing his mask back on, he formed a contract with the beast and cast it under Genjutsu before teleporting it to the center of the hidden leaf. Minato, meanwhile, was laying Naruto down at the family home, covering him up to keep him warm. As he donned the white Halri that came with his position, he marched out, intent to take back what was his and defeat the man who would do this to the village. Using his flying Raijin technique, he teleported out to Kushina using the formula he incorporated into her seal. In the distance, he heard destruction and he heard screaming. The Nine Tails was already out. He cut the chains holding Kushina and teleported her back to their home. He lay her in the bed beside Naruto to let her cuddle in calm. I'll be back, he said as he turned around. Kushina called out to him. Minato, wait. He looked back. Yeah? She spoke again. Please, don't hurt the man. It's Obito. Minato turned his whole body to face her, his eyes displaying shock. What? It's Obito, she said. He survived and he's confused. He thinks he can resurrect Rin by doing this. He doesn't understand what he's doing. Please, save him. Minato was in complete shock. He nodded. I will. He then left to go face the man. He saw him there. The man in what appeared to be a tiger pattern mask, wearing a black cloak. You're too late, fourth Hokage, he said. Minato stood there. Take off the mask, Obito. The man's shoulders dropped and he sighed. Cat's out of the bag now. Minato was startled to see his disfigured face. Obito, what's happened to you? Obito looked up. What, the face or the personality? I've been crushed many times, physically and emotionally. I'm a byproduct of a cruel and unfeeling world. Or did you expect anything less from the shinobi world? Minato gripped his blade tighter. Obito, stop this! It's madness! You just got back to the leaf. Let us take care of you. It doesn't have to be this way. He gripped his hair as if he had the worst migraine. He stomped his foot. Yes, it does! He shouted out. It's always had to be this way. This is the only way. Minato was startled by the outburst. Because of Reen? Do you really think that this is what she would want? I'll do what I have to just to see her again. I don't care if I have to kill every person on this planet to accomplish that goal. Even if she hates you, Minato asked. Obito snarled. Even if she hates me. I would have thought that a married man might understand, Obito said, his voice and words full of venom. You know what I don't understand, Minato said? I don't understand how you could betray your friends and family over a scam. You know what I don't understand, Obito asked? I don't understand where you were when Rin was slaughtered, where you were when she got killed, where were you when she died, when she got kidnapped, where were you? Minato was struck by this question. I, I was on a mission. Obito nodded. Yeah, you were. For the second time, you were too busy to save those nearest to you. First me, then Reen. When will you ever be quick enough to save everyone, Yellow Flash? Minato then cried out. I tried my best. 
He huffed and puffed. I tried my best. I didn't want either of you to die. I wanted to save you both. Obito scoffed. Your best just wasn't good enough. What you wanted to do and what you actually did are two very different things. Minato stood there and fell to his knees. I know you hate me. I know you blame me. But please, don't do this. You can't resurrect Rin. Obito sneered. I'm not planning to. I plan instead to build a new world where she never died. A world where I get to be with her forever. Minato was confused. How? Obito then continued. I plan to take all nine beasts and unite them within the ghetto statue. I'll awaken the Ten Tails. I'll become its Jinchuriki and I will cast the infinite Tsukiyomi upon this world and bring them into a world of dreams. A world where the impossible is possible. A world without war. A world without the concept of winning and losing. A perfect world where death doesn't exist and everyone can be happy and do whatever it is they desire. Minato shook his head. A genjutsu. But Obito, it's not real. And what is real? Obito asked. What's real except for what your brain tells you is real? For all you know, you're already in a genjutsu and none of this really matters. Minato stood. Perhaps so, but the Rin you know and love won't be the one you find there. She'll merely be your puppet. She'll look like Rin, talk like her. But whatever she was, she won't be in this new world of yours. Obito shook his head. I'm not doing this only for Rin. I'm doing this because you can't do your job. I'm the result and the answer to you. I walked down this path alone because you couldn't save me. And because you couldn't save anyone else. I'll do it for you in my own way. Minato stood. No, this isn't the path to peace. This is the path of running away. Obito seemed startled by this. Easy for you to say. You weren't there when all this happened. Minato took a step forward. No, because I was elsewhere. Seeing it happen to other people. Experiencing it myself. You think I felt no pain when you and Rin were killed? I cried for days. Weeks. You were family to me, but I persisted. I kept going. You know why? Because that's what a Hokage does. He doesn't flee down the easy path. He walks the long and hard path at the front. The Kage bears the pain and forges a new future the best he can. I don't know if this world I'm in is real or fake, but it's the only world I know and I'd prefer it to any other one. Obito was startled. I'm not fleeing. I'm bringing peace. I'm- You're doing nothing but running away, Minato screamed. This dream world is a genjutsu, an illusion. It's not real. You're gonna bury the truth under lies so deep that no one can distinguish the two anymore. But you'll know. You'll always know, and you'll be the only one who can't escape into that world. Obito stood there in shock. Minato stepped forward. Obito, don't run away. You can walk down this path. It may not be easy. It may be dangerous, and there may be no end in sight. But this is the world we live in. It's worth dying for. Remember why you became a shinobi. Remember why you wanted to be Hokage. Remember who you are, Obito. Obito shook his head. No, Obito is dead. I'm Toby now. Minato shook his head. If Obito were dead, you wouldn't be standing before me now crying. Obito would then realize the tears running down his cheek. Minato reached forward and pulled him into a hug. I'm so sorry for failing you. I won't fail you a third time. That's why I'm not going to let you go. Obito's eyes closed as he began to cry. Master, what have I done? I've killed Lady Kushina. Minato shook his head. No, she's still alive. If we hurry, we can save her. Obito opened his eyes. She's alive? Really? Let's go. They ran off towards the house where they found Kushina. She was laying there, barely conscious, but still breathing. Take her outside. I'll reseal it into her, Obito said. Minato lifted his wife up and carried her outside and lay her down. Biting his thumb, Obito drew blood and pressed his hand to the ground. There was a plume of smoke as the nine tails appeared there. Minato and Obito worked together and they managed to reseal the nine tails into Kushina. As soon as they did, the color returned to her face and she seemed to smile. Her eyes opened as she looked over. I knew you were still in there, Obito, she said weakly. In the distance though, Black Zetsu watched with frustration in his eyes. I knew he didn't have it in him. He would then disappear. Obito sat there as Kushina and Minato were all reunited with Naruto. He sat there in shame. He could not believe what he had done. He had allowed grief to enter his heart and he had allowed himself to become manipulated by the ghost of the Uchiha. How many people are dead because of me? He asked. Minato didn't look back at him. I don't know. Obito looked away. How can I live with myself? How can I ever face the village again after what I did? Minato kneeled down. You have all the time in the world to make up for this. But first, I want you to explain to me what happened. When you survived, tell me everything. Every detail. Tell me about this plan and about what you were taught. Obito looked up and began to recount everything. Everything about Madara, the Zetsu, the Hashirama Senju cells, the Rinnegan, the Ghetto Statue, and Project Tsukinome. As Obito sat there, he began to cry. 
I probably killed so many people in Konoha. Minato patted his shoulder. Perhaps. And your penance will be knowing that and walking free. Today, the man who attacked Konoha died and Obito killed him. The village will hear that the man who attacked them was killed and you will rejoin our ranks. You'll have to live with the guilt of what you did, but you can begin to make up for it. After this, they returned to the village and Minato brought his family and Obito with him. It was there that Kakashi finally laid eyes on him. Obito couldn't face him and Kakashi couldn't face Obito either. Both bore too much guilt to face the other. Konoha began to rebuild after this. It's then that a few things changed. First off, with the declaration that the man who had attacked Konoha was killed by Minato's own hand and that it had been Madara whom he had fought against, both technically true from a certain point of view, no suspicions were put on the Uchiha and they were never moved. And by those events, the Uchiha would not have risen up against them. The Hyuga affair may have occurred, but Hisashi Hyuga would not have been killed, as Minato would not have let Kumo bully them into this, especially knowing who was at fault and why. This leads to peace, as it becomes obvious that Kumo could not beat Konoha in a war and had only been bluffing. When it comes to Orochimaru, due to Minato not being Hirazin, Orochimaru would not have escaped his compound. This results in the death of Orochimaru, all of which affects the plot in big ways. For years, Obito worked with the Anbu. Minato did this in hopes that Obito and Kakashi might reconnect. One particular occasion when they worked together was during a mission to the Land of Woods, where they were to watch over a team exchanging scrolls. Precious secrets being traded as a form of goodwill between the two villages. Most small villages would jump at the chance to be allied with Konoha, and it seemed that the Land of Woods was to be next. So it was slightly unforeseen when they killed the Konoha group and attempted escape with the scroll Konoha possessed. It was then that the Anbu moved in. Two separate teams. One team under Kakashi Harake and one under Obito. Flanking from the sides, they would begin to perform a pincer maneuver. During this attempt, Obito came into contact with the enemy leader, a woman in a Hanya mask. The two fought for a time, but with the benefits of his Kamui ability, Obito would just phase through her attacks, which gave him plenty of openings to strike back because as you know, Kamui is one of the most busted jutsu in all of Naruto. Basically turning time and space into a sword and shield. But anyway, he had her on the end of his sword and for a moment he saw himself in her. That was all it took for him to flush away any guilt that he had. He impaled her as easy as that. The entire group was eradicated and they took the Land of Woods' scroll as spoils. They would return to the village where Kakashi and Obito would share a locker room. As Obito put his things away, Kakashi looked over at him. Would, uh, would, would you like to get a bite to eat with me? Obito was silent for a moment as he contemplated the words. He swallowed hard and took a deep breath before speaking. I don't think that's really a good idea. Why not? Kakashi asked. Obito was silent. He just closed his locker and began to leave. See, this is normally where Kakashi would decide to give him his space, but for some reason Kakashi couldn't do that. Perhaps a part of him desired to know why he was being avoided. Perhaps Kakashi sensed the awkwardness in the air and hoped to confront it. He threw his towel down on the floor and stepped out of the room after him. Why not? Kakashi asked as Obito walked away. Is it because of Rin? Obito stopped at the mentioning of her name. Kakashi spoke. I tried. I really did. I didn't want her to get hurt. I didn't want her to die. I don't know why she had to jump in front of my Chidori that way. If I had known that was her plan all along, I would have used a different technique. I swear I didn't mean for it to happen. Silence passed for a few moments before Obito spoke. I know you didn't. I know you didn't. Then why are you avoiding me? Is it something that I did? If it's not Rin, then what is it? It can't be because I'm better than you because that's not true anymore. You surpassed me a long time ago. So what have I done that's caused you to hate me like this? I don't hate you, Obito said flatly. Then why do you act like it? Why do you turn around and run every time you see me? Ever since you got back, you haven't even stopped to talk with me. Not even once. That's not true, Kakashi. Missions don't count, Obito, Kakashi said. You have to talk to me then. But I mean, any other time? I thought we were friends. We were. Then why won't you talk to me? Are we not friends anymore? Obito looked forward. We're not. He began to walk away, leaving Kakashi behind. From behind a locker, Minato stood. It was no secret that he had continuously put Obito and Kakashi on the same missions together in hopes that they would rekindle their friendship. But now it seemed like it wasn't working. In fact, it seemed like it went the other direction and pushed them apart. No, Obito was the one doing that. Obito was the one pushing them apart. Obito left and made his way home. He opened the door and sat his things down on the table and just fell into bed. 
Beside him on his bedside table sat a picture frame depicting the three of them, Team Minato and their master standing above them. He laid the picture on its face. Team Minato didn't exist anymore, and it was his fault. What started at Kanabi Bridge and continued through the escape from Kirigakure snowballed into bitterness and hate. And in the end, it turned Obito into a monster, something he couldn't recognize anymore. He began to wonder how he could ever forgive himself. So many innocent people died because of his actions, and, and what was happening now, what he was doing now, that didn't change what he had done. It merely buried the bodies of the just under the bodies of the unjust. Whether for justice or for the common good, he was still a murderer and it seemed that that's all he would ever be. There was a knock at his door. Obito begrudgingly rolled out of bed and moved to the door and opened it up. Lord Forth, Minato smiled. May I come in? Obito nodded and walked in deeper. He sat down by the table. Minato, closing the door behind him, walked in and sat down. There was silence for the better part of 30 seconds. Obito then broke with the most obvious question. What are you doing here? Minato's brows raised. Wow, that almost sounds like you don't want to see me. That's not how I meant it to sound. Minato nodded his head. Yeah, I know. Silence continued for a moment more before Minato broke it. Why are you avoiding Kakashi? Why did you tell him that you two aren't friends anymore? Because we're not, Obito said as he stood to make himself something to eat. Why not? Minato asked. I thought you two were close rivals. You even gave him your left Sharingan. Surely you two had to have been friends at one point. We were. Then what happened? Obito stopped and thought about it. I betrayed who I was. I betrayed Konoha. I betrayed Rin. I betrayed you and Lady Kushina. I betrayed Kakashi. I don't deserve to be friends with him. I already told you, Minato said. That wasn't you. That was someone else that took over, and you conquered it and came back. Obito looked back. No, that was me. It was always me. Rin. Peace. No, that was just a pretense. I chose to do what I did because I was tired of living in this world. I was tired of dealing with it. I was going to burn away all of the so-called shinobi and make a new world. I'd always felt that way. I'd always felt like I wanted the world to disappear. It wasn't for peace in the world, and it wasn't for Reen. It was for me. I gave into it because I wanted to be free of the troubles of this world. I never met my parents, and I was dumped off on my grandmother. I worked so hard to gain acceptance. Did you know I never even wanted to be a shinobi? I wanted to work construction. I wanted to build houses people could live in. Build bridges like the one we destroyed in the grass. I wanted to connect people, give them a home. But at some point in time, I craved recognition, so I changed my dream. I wanted to become Hokage. I wanted to become a shinobi. Why? Maybe so I could finally feel accepted. So I could finally feel like I belonged. I've never felt like I belonged anywhere, and I thought that if enough people respected me and cared about me, maybe I would belong somewhere. But I didn't. And because I didn't belong anywhere, I didn't want any of those places to exist any longer. I wanted to be free. I wanted to destroy the world and rebuild it in a shape where I could fit perfectly in the center. Even now, I feel that way. I didn't transform into some monster overnight, and I didn't kill the old me. I am and always have been like this, and it'll never change. So as long as I don't fit in, I'll hold resentment for this world, and because of that view, I'm ashamed of myself. No amount of Anbu work will change that. It won't change what I've done. He put the mask on the table. Minato looked down at the mask and then back up. What's this? Obito stood there for a second. This is my resignation. Minato stood. Now hold up, let's think this through. I've already thought this through, Minato Sensei. I just keep adding more bodies to the pile. It's not making me feel any better. It just keeps reminding me of who and what I am. Minato picked it up. Are you sure about this, Obito? Obito nodded. I'm sure. Minato's shoulders dropped, then he let out a sigh of disappointment. What'll you do now? Obito shrugged. Become a normal shinobi? Just patrol the village? I don't need much. I just need a job that will get me enough to live. Minato nodded. He took the mask and turned around to leave. He opened the door, but stopped. He called back behind him. You know if you ever need anything, that you can always come and talk to me, right? Obito nodded. I know. Minato nodded. Take care of yourself, Obito. He stepped out the door, closing it behind him. Time continued to pass, and Obito seemed to not really be going anywhere. Kakashi's Anbu career continued to move in full force. Years passed and Naruto would continue to grow, eventually joining the academy and studying to become a shinobi. Time and time again, Naruto was at the top of his class due to the extensive studying he did with all the resources that only the Hokage's son could afford. Always behind him was Sasuke, who was a gifted student and a warrior of the Uchiha. Sasuke wasn't a very happy child. Despite everything he could do, he always felt that it wasn't good enough. When you were the second born and your older brother was considered a legend at such a young age, you were forced to grow in their shadow. And the shadow cast by Itachi was large. It was long. Nowhere could Sasuke go without being compared in some fashion to Itachi. Wow, you're almost as handsome as Itachi, the older woman would tell him. Why can't you be as skilled as your brother, his father would ask. 
Even in his own household, he was constantly being compared to Itachi, and that left him feeling unworthy, like nothing he ever did was good enough. This little tree was twisting and contorting to find some light anywhere, but the mighty oak beside him was always blocking out the sun. Now, this wasn't really Itachi's fault. Itachi couldn't help what he was. He couldn't help that he was handsome, couldn't help that he had skill and wisdom. Most other people in Itachi's shoes would likely just tell Sasuke that it was a skill issue or that he should just get good. But Itachi was different. Itachi was the only person in the village, the only person in the family who could see Sasuke for what he was without bias. Itachi knew that Sasuke wasn't him. Sasuke wasn't Itachi and Itachi was glad. His little brother was special, he was unique, and he tried so hard all the time. And he never once failed to tell him that. But despite the love of his brother, sometimes that just isn't enough. This causes Sasuke to become determined to be better than Itachi. It makes him bitter at anyone stronger than him, and right now he's bitter at Naruto. This becomes 10 times worse when he's placed on the same team as Naruto. Naruto himself was a prodigy. With the large chakra reserves that he naturally inherited from his mother's side, Naruto found himself strong enough to use even high-level jutsu that others couldn't. And so Minato would teach him everything. Sage Mode, Rasengan, Flying Raijin, Shadow Clone. If Kakashi knew what it was, he was teaching it to Naruto, which only furthered the gap between Sasuke and Naruto's two powers. During this time, Obito was just doing his thing. He was just patrolling the village as a member of the Konoha police force. He and Kakashi had not spoken in years. Obito tended to stay behind a desk most of the time. He merely approved and disapproved documents, worked bail, and ensured that the cells were tidy and clean. He wasn't going anywhere in life, and it seemed he didn't want to, but that was when Minato came to him one day. Obito looked up at him from his work. Minato-sensei, what brings you here? Minato would speak. My son, Naruto, is about to graduate from the academy and join a shinobi team. Minato thought for a moment at how fast time had passed. Had it really been 12 years since the demon fox attack Obito had initiated? Obito smiled. Congratulations, you must be so proud. Minato returned the smile. I am, but there's a particular reason that I'm here. Obito looked up. Huh? Minato continued. My son's team will be formed soon, and he has no Jonin available to lead the team. I came here to ask you to be the mentor of Team 7. Obito shook his head while waving his hands out in front of him. Whoa, no way, no way. I can't do that. Why not? Minato asked. Because I almost freaking killed him on his birthday. You expect me to be his teacher? Minato laughed. Yes, I do. This isn't a request. Obito was startled by that. Wait, this is an order? Minato nodded. You've been wasting away behind this desk for six years. You don't use your abilities much. You're going to atrophy at this rate. Obito thought about it. I just don't know if I'm fit for the job. You're entrusting me with the futures of three children. You really think I can handle that? Minato nodded. I think you can. Silence ensued as Obito thought about it. Minato spoke up. You're the one who attacked the village. People died and you're adamant about making up for your past mistakes. You're not going to do that cooped up behind a desk all day playing with stamps. You need to take the initiative and face your problems head on. You almost killed Naruto. If you were anyone else, I'd hate you for that, but that's exactly why you need to do this. You need to make up for what you've done, so start with the ones you hurt first. You killed the Anbu agents outside of the hideout on the day of Naruto's birth, and then you worked in the Anbu for six years. You participated in many missions and saved the lives of many who would have otherwise died. I consider your debt to the Anbu paid. Next, you hurt me, Kushina, and Naruto. And now is your chance to make up for it by mentoring my son. That's the next step in paying off your debt. So will you do it? Obito shrugged. I suppose you've left me with little choice. I kind of have to now. Naruto, Sasuke, and Sakura sat there in the room, waiting for their new mentor to arrive. Naruto was setting up a prank. He sat down and waited. They waited for a long while too. Their mentor was fashionably late. But eventually, the door opened and Obito walked in. The eraser Naruto had set up to fall on their new mentor indeed fell, but it passed clean through. Obito looked down. Wow, the oldest trick in the book. Did Minato-sensei never teach you anything? He stepped in. They saw their mentor. He seemed tired and uninterested, but he was here. Sakura, meanwhile, couldn't help but notice the man's disfigured face. She kept her mouth closed. Naruto didn't, though. Why does your face look like it was crushed by a rock? Because it was, Obito said flatly as he stood there. Naruto's face turned red. Wait, really? Obito nodded. Naruto continued. Well, why do you hide the other side of your face with your forehead protector? Why not cover the scarred side instead? Because I'm blind in my left eye. Or more shall I say, my left eye is no longer in my head. Sakura covered her face, wondering how she could end up with a mentor like this. Everything about him was so frightening, from his nonchalant nature to his ruined appearance. She wondered if she had the strength to study under such a man. Naruto was embarrassed a little about having asked these questions and made these statements. 
Sasuke, however, was a different can of beans. He had seen the way that Obito had entered the room and noticed something particular. This man possessed a Sharingan. This meant one of three things. He was either an Uchiha, a friend of the Uchiha, or someone who had pilfered the eyes of an Uchiha and somehow got away with it. Whatever the answer, Sasuke was very interested. The man pulled up a seat and sat down in it. My name is Obito Uchiha, and I'm a former member of the Anbu Black Ops and a current member of the Konoha Police Force. Sasuke nodded. The man was an Uchiha. That would make things even more interesting. Obito looked around at them. So, tell me a little something about yourselves that you deem important. Like what? Sakura asked. Anything. Tell me your likes, dislikes, aspirations, anything. Sakura smiled. I was named after the cherry blossoms that bloom every year. I was born March 3rd, and it had been exceptionally warm during that time, which meant that the cherry blossoms bloomed super early. On her way to the hospital, my mother passed by the cherry blossoms and knew at that moment that she would name me Sakura. Obito gave a small smile. That's an interesting factoid. Tell me, Sakura, what are your dreams for the future? Sakura looked over for a moment with a blush. There's someone I really like. I just want to be lucky enough to become his wife. That's all I really want. Obito's small smile grew a bit larger. Ah, oh, that's a juicy bit of information. I hope your dreams come true for you, Sakura. Sakura smiled at this, beginning to believe that she was wrong in her judgment of this man based on first impressions only. Obito moved on. What about you, Naruto? You have a very unique name. What does it mean? Naruto scratched the back of his head and let off a nervous giggle. My name sounds like it was derived from an ingredient in ramen. That's because it was. You see, my mom and dad love Uncle Jiraiya-sensei so much that they decided to take the name of the character in his book and name me after him and name Jiraiya my godfather. You see, in Jiraiya's novel he wrote, The Tale of the Utterly Gutsy Shinobi, the character who served as my namesake was a shinobi who never gave up and my parents wanted me to be just like that. So I was named after him. Obito listened with a smile. There's a lot of deepness in each one of your names. Now tell me, Naruto, what are your dreams? Naruto didn't have to think for a single moment before blurting out, To be the Hokage, of course. I want to be stronger than Dad, and I want to follow in his footsteps. Obito let off a chuckle. That was my dream, too, once upon a time. What happened? Naruto asked. Obito thought for a moment. Circumstances changed. Life changed. I changed. It just doesn't seem possible anymore. He then turned to Sasuke. And what about you, short, dark, and brooding? Sasuke looked over. My name is Sasuke, he said in a voice that was not very enthusiastic. Obito looked around. Is, uh, is that it? No special meaning? Sasuke stared at him. Obito sat back. That's interesting, because I heard the rumor that you were named after the father of the third Hokage Hiruzen, Sasuke Saratobi. Naruto and Sakura looked over at Sasuke. Obito sat back in his chair. Why don't you tell us about that? Sasuke gazed at him over the knuckles of his loosely clasped hands. I was named after Sasuke Saratobi one of the 10 strongest shinobi in all of Konoha, and a member of the prestigious group, the 10 Braves, a unit of some of the greatest warriors in the Warring States period. I was named as such by my mother and father in the hopes that I would make them proud as a shinobi. Obito smiled. Oh, I'm sure they are. Sasuke scoffed. They're not. Obito was caught off guard by the statement that they weren't proud of him, but he let it slide since it wasn't his business. So tell me, Sasuke, what are your dreams? Sasuke sat back to be the strongest shinobi in the world. Obito cocked his head with a hint of a smile on his face. Oh, you also wish to become a Hokage. Sasuke scoffed once more. No, such a thing is trivial, merely a title. You can't prove yourself the strongest from behind a desk. To that, Naruto interjected. Hey, the Hokage is always the strongest shinobi in the village, you know. That's how it works. And he isn't always behind a desk. When he needs to fight and train, he's out in the field with everyone else. The name of Hokage is one that's deserving of honor because they're the strongest, not because they're a desk jockey. Sasuke thought about it. Huh, then yes, I plan to become Hokage. Fat chance, Naruto shouted out. I'm gonna be the next Hokage, believe it! Sasuke glared at him. I'm gonna catch up with you one day, Naruto, and when I do, I'm gonna leave you in the dust. I'll snatch the position of Hokage away from both you and Itachi and prove to my family that I was always the strongest son. Naruto was about to jump out of his seat. Sasuke stood ready for him. Before a fight could break out, Obito was between them, pushing each one back. Enough. We're a team, remember? If you both want to become Hokage, then you better train your asses off. Realize that there are a lot of shinobi in this village who want to be Hokage, and you won't inherit the title just because you're the Hokage's son, or because you want to be the strongest. Achieving this title, like all other things, requires grit, perseverance, wit, and dedication. But you know what else it requires? The boys look up at him inquisitively. Obito continued, it requires rivalry. When two people attempt to outdo the other, you continue a constant cycle of one-up. Eventually, you'll leave all competition in the dust as you push yourself beyond what you're naturally capable of, and eventually, you'll find that you've left everyone else in the dust. That's what happened with me and my rival, Kakashi. He was always stronger than me, but my determination pushed me further. 
If you both try your best, I'm certain one of you will become Hokage one day. Maybe both. But for now, you gotta train. Naruto and Sasuke pulled away from each other and gave a nod of approval. And with that, Obito began the process of training them. Now, Obito did not do the bell test like Kakashi would have. He felt that these were things that you learned on your own and weren't expected to know from the start. After all, new teams seldom worked well together. But so long as they listened to him, he would continue to remind them about the importance of teamwork. They did little jobs here and there, and when they weren't doing work, they were training. They would spar together, work out together, and do anything and everything together. To a point, Sakura began to feel left out, because Naruto and Sasuke were too focused on each other to bother with her. But Obito stuck with her. He told her that she reminded him of someone he used to know, and told her that her path lay on a different road. Instead of becoming Hokage, she dreamed of ministering whoever would be. He told her that she was smart, intelligent, and possessed good chakra control. And while she wasn't entirely the strongest at the moment, she was capable of a lot of things, and displayed potential about as great as both Naruto and Sasuke. He told her that he believed that these two would eventually hurt themselves as hard as they were pushing their bodies. And when that happened, they would need someone to watch over them and help them heal. He told her that this is what he thought her natural talent was. She would nod and begin working on studying these things. He gave her all the resources he felt she would need to become a passable medical nin and let her study. Minato, all the while, was impressed with Obito's ability to lead them and teach them. He kept an eye on them, and when he saw how well Naruto reacted to Obito's teaching, he began to consider something new. As he walked in on Naruto, hanging from a bar in his room by his legs, doing inverted sit-ups, Minato stepped in. Hey, Naruto, how do you like your new teacher? Naruto looked at his father with a smile, upside down. Obito-sensei, he's great. He's strong and wise, and best of all, he's one of your students. He said he's gonna help me and Sasuke grow stronger since Sasuke wants to be Hokage too, just to prove that he's stronger than his brother. Minato nodded his head as he listened. Hmm, maybe I have a special mission for you and your team. How would you like to escort a VIP to a quaint fishing village? Naruto fell off his bar. He looked up at his father from the floor. You mean, an actual mission? Not like with picking up old candy wrappers or carrying groceries for old ladies, but like a real mission? Like, with fighting? Uh, I don't know about how much fighting you'll do, but according to the forum, there is a possibility you run into some bandits and if you do, well, then you'll have to protect your VIP now, wouldn't you? Naruto stood up, his eyes glistening with excitement. Yeah, I would love that. Minato would laugh. Okay then, don't tell the others. I'll assign it to your team tomorrow. See if Obito thinks you're ready for this level of mission. Until then, get some rest. The next day, the four of them stood in the Hokage's office. He was handing out missions to each shinobi team as they came. Naruto was rubbing his hands together with excitement, showing excitement on his face as well. Sasuke and Sakura looked at him with confusion in their eyes. Obito stepped forward to the desk. Minato, wearing a set of reading glasses, looked down at the papers. He looked up at Obito. I only have one mission for your team today, a mission outside of the village. Obito looked at him curiously. Minato pushed the mission summary to Obito and let him read it. A VIP escort mission to the Land of Waves? Minato nodded. Do you think your team can handle it? Obito looked back. Yeah, I'm sure they could, but isn't this closer to Chunin level? Minato shook his head. It's close, but it's not quite there. There are no planned enemy combatants. The only thing you may face is low-level bandits, likely thieves who don't even know how to use ninjutsu. So that falls just into the purview of a team full of genin. Obito looked back at his team. You told Naruto about this, didn't you? Minato laughed nervously. I might have mentioned it by accident before bed. Obito sighed with a smile. I suppose I can't let him get disappointed then. I'll take the mission. Minato smiled. If anything happens, or if at any time you feel that the mission has become more than you and they can handle, feel free to return to the village with the VIP. I'll just assign it to a team of Chunin then. Obito nodded. He walked back to his team. Looks like we're going on an escort mission, gang. Naruto feigned surprise. What? Really? Are you sure we're ready for such a thing, Obito-sensei? Sasuke and Sakura didn't seem amused. How long do we have to prepare? Sasuke asked. Obito looked at his watch. I'll say no more than an hour and a half. All you have to do is create a bug out bag. That should be plenty for this mission. You do know how to make a bug out bag, right? The team shrugged. All save Sasuke, who had some idea of what one was due to Itachi letting him help him make one a few times with him. Obito spoke. A bug out bag is something that's always nice to keep ready. It has only the bare essentials in it, enough to last you at least 72 hours on a battlefield or anytime you're out of the village. For myself, I include extra socks, underwear, water, lightweight foods that are easy to prepare, like cans of cooked beans and sausages, granola bars, etc. A first aid kit just in case someone gets hurt, some scrolls, ninja tools, and between you and me, I also add some entertainment for times when there's just nothing happening. He pulls out a copy of Makeout Paradise from his jacket. This novel series was actually something he began reading not long after joining the Anbu. Kakashi gifted him with a first edition copy of the very first novel. It was very rare and special. 
He was apprehensive at first. Romance novels were never his thing, but all things considered, it was a lemon told from the perspective of a rich playboy, something pretty much every teenager wanted to be at the time. It was one of the few shreds of evidence that he and Kakashi had ever had a bond, and though Obito felt unworthy of it, he held onto it for a memento of a time when they were closer. And so, each member of the team went home to prepare for their trip. Obito had a bug out bag ready at all times, so he was ready to go at a moment's notice. During this time, he stopped for ramen at Ichiraku, where he just so happened to sit down beside Kakashi. It wasn't planned or anything by either party, but all the same, they found themselves sitting there with each other. Obito had been seen, so it was too late to stand up and leave. He felt unworthy, but he didn't want to be rude. He attempted to sit by himself, but as the ramen bowl was brought to him, Kakashi soon followed suit and sat down next to his old friend. Hey, he said. Obito looked over and gave a light smile. Hey. Kakashi sat there right beside him. I heard you left the police force. Teaching the next generation, it seems. Obito nodded. Someone's gotta do it. Kakashi gave a light chuckle. Maybe I should get into it. I'm getting tired of the Anbu. I might like an easier job. Obito took a sip from his ramen and attempted to softly ignore Kakashi in hopes that his former friend might lose interest and go his own way, but Kakashi pressed harder. What happened to us, Obito? Obito took a breath and sighed. The shinobi world happened to us. Kakashi sat there in silence. I still don't understand why it drove such a wedge between us. When you came back to the village, I was so happy. I had been alone for so long, and finally a friend I thought dead was returned to me, but we just never reconnected. Was it my fault? Obito shook his head. No, it wasn't your fault. It was never your fault. I just, a lot of things changed for me after Kanabi Bridge. A lot of things changed for me, and I didn't like who I was becoming. Kakashi sat there. Rin's death hit me hard. It was the last straw left. I changed too. I became merciless, angry, tyrannical as a team leader. Obito shrugged. I just don't like to talk about that time. It's a period of my life that I'd rather just forget. Kakashi looked over at him. You were always so happy when we were younger. You always thought that a team should stick together, that friends should never abandon each other. We're still a team, Obito. Even though Rin's not here anymore, the two of us are a team. He put his hand on Obito's back. We are stronger together, he said as he gave him a little pat. If you ever decide you want to talk to me, you know where to find me. Kakashi stood and made his way out the door. Teuchi was standing there with his classic smile on his face, just staring at Obito while washing the dishes. Obito continued to eat. Once he was finished, he paid for his meal and went home where he picked up his own bug out bag and made his way to the gate where he stood. He looked at his watch. It didn't take very long for the VIP, a bridge worker named Tazuna, to show up. They stood there for a while and Obito apologized to Tazuna for his team being late. Tazuna brushed it off. They both stood there. In the distance, Team Obito began to make their way to the gate. They walked up and stopped in front. Obito smiled. Are we ready to go then, team? They all nodded. Obito turned around and began to lead them off onto their first real mission. They walked down the road toward the Land of Waves. As they did, Obito couldn't help but think about his relationship with Kakashi. He didn't truly deserve to reconnect with him, but then again, nothing Obito was doing did he truly deserve. Students, a peaceful life, a second chance, he didn't deserve any of it, so what difference would it make? He had always believed that if he and Kakashi stood together then they could do anything. All the while they walked, Obito had been lost in thought, head in the clouds, daydreaming. He didn't notice the puddle out of place until it was too late. The demon brothers sprang their trap and attempted to sever him in two with a chain very similar to the one he had used. By the time he saw them, it was too late to move. Kamui! He suddenly went intangible, the chain passing through him like it were nothing. In a moment of instinct, he summoned wooden constructs from the ground, two spikes to impale the demon brothers. Sakura screamed in terror. In that moment, Obito realized where he was and what he was doing. He had forgotten that he had brought children with him. Oh well. Looking into the eyes of those nearby, he saw Sakura seemed terrified. She had her eyes closed like she was about to cry. Naruto's eyes were open, though his appearance and half-cocked smile insinuated that while he was freaked out, he certainly hadn't lost his composure. He'll probably throw up later or be unable to sleep, but he would survive. Sasuke, on the other hand, showed no signs of trauma, more so that he enjoyed it, or at the very least thought the technique used to defeat them was interesting. Obito moved to the bodies and checked them out, looking them over. Hidden mist. Perhaps not, but definitely organized. He looked back at Tazuna. These are too highly skilled to be simple bandits. What aren't you telling us, Tazuna? The man sighed. Please, I just need to get home. Not until you explain this to us, Obito said. I couldn't afford Chunin, so I had to settle for Genin. Obito nodded his head in a slightly judging manner. I see, I see. So you decided to put children in danger for a fraction of the price. Intelligent, intelligent. Tazuna shook his head. No. 
It's not like that, I, I swear. I, I just didn't have the resources. Nobody in my village does. It's a miracle I was able to even get to the Leaf. We're in bad shape in the Land of Waves. A crime lord has taken over. If we build the bridge, we can be free of him, but he won't let us. He's been killing bridge workers. We just need protection. Obito shook his head. Sorry, Tazuna, but you lied. And this is well into Chunin territory now. We're calling this mission off. Tazuna hit his knees. Please, if you quit now, people will die. I know I lied to you and I'm sorry for that, but I only did it because I felt like I needed to. Please, understand. Don't you understand what it's like to be powerless? To be crushed under someone else's thumb, all because of circumstances that have nothing to do with you? Obito thought about it. Tazuna prostrated himself before him. Please, help us. If you don't, our little village is finished. Please, Sensei, Naruto said. Obito looked back as Naruto continued. I'm not Hokage yet, but it's a shinobi's duty, like that of a Kage, to do everything in their power to save people, no matter what the cost or risk. So, can we help him? Obito thought about it and sighed. Fine, we can, but you better stay behind me and listen to my every order no matter what. Got it? Naruto agreed, as did the rest of Team 7. Obito then walked over to the deceased demon brothers and removed their gauntlets from their hands. He looked at them. This is a bit of an upgrade from 12 years ago. He kept the gauntlets with him. I always did like fighting with chains. Was never as good as with a blade. Maybe now I can finally practice. So together, the five of them continued on, but eventually they would come across Zabuza, who would be there to stop them. Obito looked at him for a moment. Ah, yes, the wielder of the Executioner's Blade, Zabuza of the Seven Swordsmen of the Mist. Zabuza looked at him. Formerly of the Mist, now just a swordsman. How is it that you know of me? Obito smiled. I know a lot of things. Zabuza jumped down. Then you should know by now that I have a contract to kill that old man. Obito looked back at Tazuna. He returned his gaze to Zabuza. Yes, I know. He told me. Didn't expect such a powerful mercenary to be hired, though. It seems Gato means business. Zabuza then spoke. I'm relieved that you know as much as you do. It means I don't have to waste time explaining it to you. He unsheathed the massive blade. I hope you've prepared. Obito put his newly acquired gauntlets on his hands. My friend, I've fought people far stronger than you. I doubt I'll break a sweat. Obito rushed forward towards Obito. As soon as he did, however, Obito's Sharingan transformed into a Mongekyo. He rushed towards Zabuza. As Zabuza swung his massive cleaver of a blade, Obito merely phased through it with Kamui catching him with the chains. He summoned a wooden spike behind him to tie Zabuza to. He chained him up and then walked towards him. Zabuza was astounded by how quickly the battle had ended. What are you? Obito thought about it. A ghost of a dead man. Zabuza looked at this. You were lucky. Obito shook his head. No, you were just careless. You were too overconfident in yourself and your big blade. It's never the big blade that's dangerous. No, it's the little blade no one sees. That's the dangerous blade. Zabuza smiles. Indeed. Suddenly, Senbon came out of nowhere and struck Obito in his neck, causing him to stumble. Out of the trees, Haku appears and cuts the chain holding Zabuza. By the time Obito recovers, they're gone. Damn it, he exclaims, as if this curse is going to change anything. He sighs, and together with Tazuna, they begin to make their way back to the bridge worker's home. There, he's presented with medical supplies, which Sakura carefully begins to apply. Are you okay? Obito nods. Yes, I am. Entire left side of my body still feels numb, though. Stupid nerve-based attacks. All the while, Obito is focused on repairing his gear. As he does so, he begins to notice that the gauntlets are massive and clunky. Yeah, they'd make good blunt force instruments, but that doesn't really fit his style. As he repairs the chain carefully, he begins to take stock of how much of this is really required. Given that all the abilities of these gauntlets that he needs are the claws and the chain, he decides to strip it down to a pair of clawed gloves and a set of chains that fit on the wrists like shackles. It's all he really needs. Content with his work, he puts the weapons on his hands. I bet I could even catch that executioner's blade with this thing. What do you think, Sakura? She just smiles and gives him a thumbs up. Obito returns the gesture before wondering where Sasuke and Naruto went. Outside, they're sparring. Just give it up, Sasuke. I'm always going to be ahead of you, and that's all there is to it. Sasuke scoffs. The longer you believe that, the further ahead of you I'll go. Inari just sits on the porch, watching them spar. Considering how strong they all are, he begins to truly wonder if this group of shinobi will be enough to drive Gato out and avenge Kaiza. Obito watches from the door. Are you interested in becoming a shinobi too, Inari? The boy shakes his head. I want to be a contractor like grandfather. I want to build things. I want to build homes and bridges and things that connect people. Obito looked down at the boy, who shared the same dream he once had. He smiled. That's a good dream, Inari. Never let it go. Do whatever makes you happy. Being a shinobi takes a special kind of person willing to hurt all the time. I don't want someone like you giving up your dreams for pain. 
Inari looked up at the man who seemed to be talking to himself now, and in fact he was. Obito was busy speaking with Inari, but his mind was in another place, wishing that he himself had remained true. It was too late to go back now. He had already suffered so much. He was merely a shell of the starry-eyed child he once had been. All he could do was move forward. That's all anyone could really do. The day after, the team merely watched over the bridge's construction. It was a truly boring task, it seemed, at least for Team 7, but for the bridge workers, you could cut the tension with a knife. It was out of nowhere that Zabuza appeared. Obito was up. He saw him coming and began to make his way towards him. He sighed as he fastened his new gauntlets to his hands. You should have learned by now. I was merciful last time, but do you expect me to be lenient forever? Turn back now and I'll let you live. Zabuza smirked. The same thing goes for you. Obito would rush into Zabuza to strike him. Zabuza would feint a swing of his blade and instead stab into the ground. Obito would materialize, but his chain was caught on the executioner's blade. Zabuza took this moment to elbow Obito in the back of the head. Obito would hit his knees, stunned. Zabuza would pick up his blade and prepare to carve Obito down the middle. Before he could, however, Obito activated Kamui and fled into another dimension, reappearing before him. He rubbed the back of his neck. Ouch. Yeah, you got me good that time. I suppose I was the one to be a little too confident. I won't make that mistake twice. Zabaza scoffed gleefully. I bet not. That's why I need to enact a new strategy. Obito and Zabaza circled each other for a time until Zabaza eventually came in with a strike. Obito phased through it and then tried to claw at him with the razors at the end of his fingers, which Zabaza amazingly blocked with his blade. As his claws were dragging down across the face of the sword, leaving their mark, Obito could only marvel at how quickly and easily Zabaza wielded the heavy weapon. As they continued to exchange blows, Obito heard a cry. He saw Naruto and Sasuke trapped within Haku's demonic mirroring ice crystals. Zabaza laughed. You lose. Do it, Haku. Kill them. Obito, in a panic, used his Kamui to teleport into the trap where he took the Senbon meant for Naruto and Sasuke. He fell to his knees. Sensei! Naruto and Sasuke cried out. All the while, Zabuza slowly stepped into the ice crystals. Even with your cheesy ability, you couldn't defeat me. Naruto and Sasuke step between Obito and Zabuza, but the mercenary knocks them away. You overestimated your abilities, Uchiha. He raised his blade and began to drop it on Obito. Obito lifted his hands, and with his gauntlets, he caught the executioner's blade. He looked up, his Sharingan still active. No, you underestimated me again. Suddenly, from below Zabaza came a wooden spike that impaled him. Upon seeing this, Haku cried out, No, Zabaza! In his rage, the boy rushed Obito. Obito's Sharingan was quick. He lifted his hand, and despite Haku's speed, Obito managed to grab the boy by the throat with his clawed hands. His Sharingan stared at him from the corner of its socket, his face splashed with blood. I'll destroy all the so-called shinobi. A tight squeeze and a yank, he ripped Haku's windpipe clean from his throat. He stood there like a demon bathing in the blood of its victims. This was enough for even Sasuke to show discomfort. Naruto was confused at what he was seeing, and Sakura almost burst into tears. Obito looked back at them. What is it? Did this scare you? It's the shinobi world. You gotta learn to slaughter them before this becomes you. There's no room for weakness. He walks away from the gory scene, only for Gato to speak. Well done, well done. A truly hearted warrior, a monster indeed. If only I could have hired you. Obito looked back at Gato. Oh, what's that? Did I hear a dead man talking? Gato laughed. His army appeared. You would threaten me. You may have had enough to beat Zabuza and Haku, but you'll never be enough to kill me and all my men. Obito was enough. He was more than enough, in fact. With the benefits of his Kamui and his wood release, Obito was an untouchable ghost. The demon within letting itself loose in the name of justice. A rabid dog chained up and tied to the judge's podium. Maybe this isn't always who Obito has been, but it was who he is now. Regardless of how much he hated it, this was who he was now, and no amount of good deeds, no amount of love shown to him would ever drive out the truth of the shinobi world, nor its side effects. You could take the shinobi out of the darkness, but you could never take the darkness out of the shinobi. Standing among the corpses littering the bridge, he wiped his lip with the one clean spot on his arm as he turned around and disappeared from the battle like a ghost. Returning to his team, he saw the looks upon their faces. Sakura couldn't stop crying, hiding behind Tezuna. Sasuke was avoiding eye contact, and Naruto couldn't stop making eye contact, the front of his trousers stained with pee. Obito took a breath and sighed, returning to the home of Tezuna, where he would have his shower and change into an extra set of clothes he had brought in his bug out bag. Looking at his former outfit, the blood, he knew there was no saving them, so he just tossed them away. It was very quiet that night, and it was quiet the day after as they returned home. Obito found himself back in Konoha, in the bar. He sat on the stool and just asked the bartender to leave the whole bottle. Eventually, the door opened up and Minato stepped in. He asked if the seat beside him was taken. 
Obito motioned for him to sit before lipping the neck of his sake bottle. Naruto told me what happened, Minato said. Obito scoffed. Let me guess, he required a transfer. Minato shook his head. No, he actually didn't. He thought it was an important lesson to learn. Obito sipped his drink again. He would have learned it eventually. Minato sat there silently for the span of 10 seconds. What's wrong, Obito? Is something bothering you? Obito put his drink down and looked at the bar table. What happened to Zabaza? To Haku? What I did? That was the real me. I thought I could change it, but I was merely lying to myself. Minato shook his head. No, it can be. You just slipped in the heat of the moment. It's happened to men far greater and far lesser than you. Obito looked at Minato with a face skeptical of his reasoning, devoid of care. I'm not depressed, nor am I upset at what I did. Disappointed? Maybe. Upset? Not in the least. After all, I walked in the darkness of the shinobi world for so long, one might believe that I actually am the darkness. No matter where I go, no matter which side I fight for, bodies begin to stack up. I don't care what Naruto said, what any of them said. I know how they saw me, what they felt. It was written all over their faces. They may not be willing to drop me, but I am. I'm done. Minato was startled. Huh? Obito said it once more. I'm done. Minato shook his head with a sigh. You really have changed, Obito. You really have changed. Obito looked at him from the corner of his eye. What's that supposed to mean? Minato took his bottle and downed a guzzle from it before wiping his mouth with his sleeve. You changed from the boy you used to be. No matter what side you take, you'll always be Toby, won't you? You're not even trying anymore. You're just gonna keep doing the same thing you've always done since you returned to the leaf. You're gonna do here what you did in the Anbu and what you did to Kakashi. You're gonna run away. Obito stood. I'm not running away, he shouted. His finger pointed to Minato's face. Minato took one look at the finger and turned his gaze upward. If you don't move that finger away from my face in the next three seconds, you're gonna lose it. Obito begrudgingly pulled it away. Minato turned to face him. You've got issues, Obito. Legitimate issues. Your actions on the bridge aren't the ones I'm talking about. You're a shinobi. That's what we do. We kill. We spare when we can, but in the end, the shinobi world is nothing but darkness. You told me that you never felt like you belonged anywhere, and you wanted to burn away where you don't fit. But that's exactly where you fit right there in the middle of the fire, the chaos. That's where every shinobi fits, and I specifically chose you to mentor my son because I knew you could show him the darkness, show him what he'll have to confront. And I had been hoping that you would open your heart enough to let him remind you of what the light is, why we work in the dark in the first place. I guess I was wrong. Feel free to go back to your desk job in the Konoha police force. Go back to wasting away in self-pity. I'm not gonna coddle you anymore, and I'm not gonna make excuses for a man too blinded by his self-centered nature to make good on our deal and actually help the village he hurt so badly. Minato walked out. Obito was left with his jaw on the floor. He had never seen his kind and understanding master speak like that before. It seemed so cruel, but in actuality, Obito supposed that it was more like brutal honesty. He was being brutally honest. He was right though. He had made mistakes, and it was time that he dealt with them. He paid for the sake and left the bar. He walked into Ichiraku Ramen and sat down. There, Kakashi was already sitting. You called me here, Kakashi asked. Obito nodded. I feel I need to say something. Something I should have said 12 years ago. Kakashi turned to face him. I'm listening. Obito went to start, but took a deep breath and stopped. He looked up at Teuchi. Do you mind? Teuchi gave them a thumbs up and stepped out back. He knew he could trust these two. No need to stay guarded. Obito watched as the back door closed. He felt bad about that, but he desired privacy. He looked down to the table and spoke again. The reason I ended our friendship was because of me, not you. Kakashi continued to listen. I made a lot of mistakes, Kakashi. Kakashi gave a short chuckle. We all have, Obito. Obito sat up and faced him. No, not like I have. He stopped and thought about what he was going to say. Remember when Minato-sensei said that Madara Uchiha attacked the village 12 years ago and was killed by him? Kakashi nodded. Obito continued. It was a cover-up. Madara never attacked the village. Only someone bearing his name. Kakashi leaned in closer in curiosity. Who was it then? Obito looked down. It was me. Kakashi seemed to recoil from this revelation. Obito looked up. It was me. I released the nine-tailed fox from Kushina, and I commanded it to destroy the leaf. I had believed that by gathering all nine-tailed beasts together that I could have reined back, but it was foolishness. A lie. I knew it, but I needed something to believe in. Kakashi looked at him in shock. Obito continued, That's why I've been avoiding you, why I've been running away from everyone and everything. Minato-sensei helped me realize today that I was still running, not from you or from my team, but from myself, my past. But I don't want to run anymore. I want to make amends. I want to help the people I've hurt, and I need your help. Kakashi would seem startled by this truth, speechless. Obito would sigh. I get it. 
I'll just go. He stood and went to leave, but suddenly he felt arms wrap around him. Obito, we're stronger together. Remember, you said that. We'll be unbeatable so long as we stand side by side. I won't abandon you again. Obito felt his eyes overrunning with tears. Outside in the alleyway, Minato listened to the conversation and smiled. boy, you're no longer running, Obito. And so Obito and Kakashi continued to reconnect, forming a relationship akin to brothers. Obito eventually returned to his team, and during the time they spent working, whatever Obito was, whatever he had become, was accepted by his team, who came to understand that this was what the shinobi world truly was, and this was what they would need to deal with in order to survive in the real world. Eventually, the years went by and Team 7 finally made Chunin, but during that time, Sasuke and his family were hit hard with the unexpected passing of Itachi due to a previously undiagnosed illness. Obito remembered coming to Sasuke and asking if he were okay, and Sasuke merely stating, This is not how I wanted to surpass him. Obito had never seen Sasuke cry before. Sasuke had finally become the sole hope to Fugaku's legacy being passed on, but despite this, Sasuke felt like he could never truly catch up to his brother, nor that he could ever live up to expectations. He was now in an eternal race against a ghost, his brother having died while on top, unable to ever be truly surpassed. Or so Sasuke believed. Whether or not Sasuke ever surpassed what Itachi was in life was totally up to Sasuke, but even if he did, he would never feel worthy of it. That was a feeling Obito knew all too well, which is why he continued to encourage Sasuke. The loss of his brother had awakened a Mangekyo Sharingan within him, and while Sasuke felt alone in this pain, Obito would every so often flash his own Mangekyo at Sasuke whenever he would see him enter his funk, to remind him that there was still one who understood. All while this was happening, Black Zetsu had not spent his time doing nothing. He had convinced Nagato that he was the manifestation of the will of the Sage of Six Paths, which he could display with his vast repository of knowledge. He eventually convinced Nagato to begin attempting to capture the tailed beasts, which he mostly managed to do, but one tailed beast in particular was eluding him, and this was the Ninetales. Kakashi and Obito would often stick close, and despite everything he had done, Obito could finally feel these stains of time being washed away as he found a place to belong. He once more began looking forward to the mornings that he got to train with his team and with Kakashi. But the past doesn't always stay in the past, and no matter how much you wish to forget it, it never forgets you. It was this day that the skies opened up, and from within came the Six Paths of Pain. The entire village was aflame due to the power of the Six Paths. The moment he saw this, Obito felt like he might throw up. Who is that? Kakashi asked as he looked into the sky at the diva path. Obito swallowed. That's Nagato. When Madara perished, he told me he had transplanted his Rinnegan into a young Uzumaki boy in Amegakure, and to use him when the time came to resurrect Madara. But it seems he's found his way to us. Kakashi would listen. Boy, you really botched stuff up, didn't you? Why didn't you mention this? Obito looked to Kakashi. I did, but Minato couldn't do anything about it. By the time he learned of it, Nagato was already the leader of the Akatsuki a peace-loving group that at the time was officially sanctioned under Ame's forces. To move against Nagato at that time would have been an act of war. Kakashi looked up to the sky. Well, whether we waited or not, war comes all the same. Let's go. They both raced off towards the battlefield. All the while, in Kushina and Minato's abode, Black Setsu appeared. Kushina was currently watching TV, watching the events transpiring outside. She didn't know that Zetsu had entered her home and was sneaking up behind her. He suddenly reached behind and gripped her by the neck and mouth, planning to drag her away. But in a split second, he learned why she was called the Red Hot Habanero of the Leaf. With what seemed to be a form of judo, she flipped him over her shoulder and smashed him into the television. His body morphed about, getting him upright again. Kushina jumped back and entered a defensive stance. Zetsu rushed forward and gripped her by the skull, pushing her into the wall. Outside, the six paths of pain were attempting to cause as much destruction as possible. They were the decoys. While they made it look like they were searching for Kushina, the shinobi would focus on them, unaware that they already had her. But to their surprise, Obito and Kakashi appeared, alongside Naruto, Sasuke, and Sakura. Together, they all fought. Obito gave commands, being the one who knew the six paths the best. After all, Madara had taught him everything while he was alive. Obito commanded that the first path to be defeated should be the Naraka path, because so long as the King of Hell was still in play, all destroyed paths of pain could easily be resurrected. And so, both Kakashi and Obito would focus on that one while the rest of Team 7 bought them time. Back at Kushina's home, she stumbled into the kitchen where she grabbed a frying pan. All of her years off the battlefield had done a lot to rust her skills, but her time as a mother had taught her a brand new set, and the two weren't mutually exclusive. Holding the pan, she instinctively called upon the power of the Ninetales and entered her version 1 cloak, being capable of knocking him back a bit, but despite her power, she couldn't quite take care of him by herself. 
She tried desperately to remember how. She formed a Rasengan, just as Minato had taught her all those years ago and went to strike him with it, but Black Zetsu pushed it away, causing her to blow out half the house. Back in the battle, Obito and Kakashi stood over the ruined Naraka path. Obito looked back. Naruto, go check on your mother. This is a feint. They're here for her. Go take her to a safe place. Naruto nodded and left the battlefield. Obito, Sasuke, Kakashi, and Sakura all stood there as the rest of the Anbu mobilized. Obito looked to Sasuke and Sakura. Go help the Anbu push back the other paths. Me and Kakashi will take the diva. Sasuke and Sakura nodded. They turned and began to rush off. Obito looked back at Kakashi. Are you sure you want to stick by me, Kakashi? The diva is the most dangerous one of all. Kakashi put his hand on Obito's shoulder. That's exactly why I'm going to stick by you. I don't want you dealing with this alone. Obito smiled as his Mangekyo activated. Shall we then? Kakashi lifted the sash covering his left eye. Let's do it. They turned and rushed towards the diva path. Naruto ran home. Opening the door, he saw the destruction. Seeing the hole in the back leading out, Naruto rushed through the alleyways until he saw Zetsu dragging an unconscious Kushina. Hey! He shouted as he jumped from wall to wall, building both height and momentum. As Zetsu turned to look around, he would see Naruto's foot coming straight at his face. Naruto would strike him, sending him rolling. Naruto would check in on Kushina and realize that she was okay. He would stand and enter Sage Mode. You screwed with the wrong family, you Venom wannabe! Unable to understand the out-of-universe reference, Zetsu smiled. You are truly a fool. The Nine Tails belongs to me and my mother. I will return it to its rightful owner and you won't stop me. The two engaged in battle where Naruto proved himself to be talented, but otherwise unable to deal with Zetsu on his own. After all, Zetsu had over a thousand years of experience under his belt. There was seldom a better trained physical combatant than Zetsu, and Naruto came to realize this as he hit the ground. Zetsu approached him with a blade in his hand. I suppose this was 16 years in the making, he said. Your master was supposed to kill you on the day of your birth, but he chickened out. Now I, the one carrying out the will he threw away, will finish it for him. Naruto spat at Zetsu. Don't you dare say Obito-sensei's name. He may have made some mistakes, but he's more of a man than you'll ever be. Zetsu stopped and listened to what he said. Hmm, maybe that's true. But I'll be more than you at least when I send you to death's door. Zetsu raised his blade to strike Naruto down when suddenly a custom-made shuriken landed on the ground between them. In a flash appeared Minato, who in one fluid motion rose and pushed a Rasengan into Zetsu's stomach that soon erupted and evaporated him into nothing. Minato turned back. Naruto, are you okay? Naruto nodded. I'm fine. Minato helped him sit up before rushing to Kashina, relief displaying upon his face when he came to realize that she was okay too. She's okay, now help me get her into the house. Naruto shook his head. Sorry, Dad, but Obito-sensei needs me. I'll see you later. Naruto rushed off. Obito and Kakashi were caught between a rock and a hard place. The diva path was powerful, but Obito and Kakashi's teamwork was impeccable. Both sharing an ability, they used it to their advantage. As chakra rods came for them, Kakashi would use his long-range Kamui to teleport them away. Obito would then go strike diva path, only to fake him out and pass right through him with a short-range Kamui, allowing Kakashi to get the strike. Then, from behind, Obito would manifest the chakra rods that Kakashi had teleported away and pin Diva to the ground by his hands. Kakashi would then prepare a Chidori to finish him off, but Diva Path would use his almighty push to knock them both away. If you wish to fight me together, then you can perish together. The Diva Path would pull free from the chakra rods and would utilize Chibaku Tensei to lock them both within a miniature moon. As the stone around them began to crush, Obito reached out and grabbed Kakashi's hand. I'm sorry, Kakashi. This is my fault. Kakashi looked to his friend, unable to move. No, Obito. This isn't you. I'm with you to the end. Outside, Pain watched as the Chibaku Tensei rose into the sky. Naruto rushed over and witnessed this, sensing their chakra from within. Sensei! He called out. There was silence. But suddenly, the Chibaku Tensei began to pull apart. From within, a massive Azure Susano appeared, clawing its way out. And within the Susano stood Kakashi and Obito, hand in hand, both Mangekyo Sharingan burning with crimson light. Pain attempted to bring the remnants of the Chibaku Tensei down on the Susano, but the massive chakra avatar turned around and threw shuriken up at the falling stones, teleporting them out with Kamui. The Susano rushed towards Diva and utterly stomped him into ashes. The battle was over, and the rest of the team celebrated. Everyone but Obito, who knew better. When nobody was paying attention, he turned and left the village, headed somewhere. Coming to a massive tree that was formed of paper, he stepped in to see Nagato and Conan. Conan seemed defensive, but Nagato told her to stop, as there was likely nothing they could do to stop him. Obito stepped forward. Nagato looked down at him from his puppet walker. Have you come to kill me? Obito shook his head. No, I've come to let you kill yourself. Conan grew defensive. Are you so cruel? Do it yourself if you have the gonads. Obito shook his head again. You misunderstand. 
I know you've gone through pain, and I know you feel like it's too late, but it's not. I've known pain too. Nagato listened to him. I know your two great pains, Nagato. Your first was the loss of your parents during the second Great Ninja War, and your second was the loss of Yahiko during the third. Obito took a breath. I too know pain. My great pain was the love of my life, Rin Nohara. While away, recovering from an injury, she was hunted down and captured by the Hidden Mist, who implanted her with a tailed beast. They planned to use her as a weapon against my village. By the time I arrived to save her, she'd been killed by my best friend. He unintentionally helped her commit suicide, and for the longest time, I lost faith in the world. I attempted to burn it down, just as you are now. I killed so many people, but eventually found my master who reminded me who I am and who Reed wanted me to be. I could never make up for what I've done, but I have returned to the old Obito I used to be, and will never rest until I bring peace to this world. And now, I'm going to ask you the same question my master asked me. If Yahiko were here, would he be able to love the Nagato you've become, or would he turn from his brother in disgust? Nagato thought about this. He remembered the man of peace Yahiko had once been and knew in his heart that Yahiko would never support what he was doing. It's too late to go back, Nagato said. Obito nodded, perhaps, but it's not too late to move forward, to jump tracks and end up on the proper path. He extended his hand to him. Will you join me? Nagato thought for a moment. You're right, I should return to the path, but I will not take your hand. Instead, I'll walk my own path. He put his hands together. I will restore the dead that I've killed and pay for my crimes. Then I will be with Yahiko again, and we'll both entrust you to take up our cause. Bring peace, Obito. And with that, all the dead were revived, and Nagato perished. Obito took a deep breath. He looked to Conan. What about you? Where will you go? She shook her head. I do not know. Obito extended his hand to her. Come with me. Let me show you where I went. Maybe you'll get an idea. After all, we both must bear the dreams of Yahiko and Nagato. She nodded and followed him. The two of them would return to Konoha. There, Obito would be celebrated as a hero, a celebration he felt he did not deserve. Minato, however, told him to bask in it, as he had done good and saved many people, and for the sakes of those he had defended, he should celebrate. So he did. Time continued to pass, and eventually Minato steps down from his position as Hokage. He elects to hand it down to Obito, who at first refuses, believing that a man who had attempted to destroy the village would never be worthy of running it. But Minato reminds him that he had made a promise to bring peace to the world, and so Obito decides to accept the position with much humility. He would, along with Conan as his aide, do his best to bring peace to the world. And though the world is still embroiled in conflict, hope for the future burns bright, as Obito realizes that anyone can change, and anyone can become a hero. He hopes that one day, the rest of the world will choose that and become heroes as well, ending the fighting for good. And that's the end of this story. I hope you enjoyed it. I loved tracking Obito's emotional development, his struggles with his inner demons, and his past. But in the end, he admits his faults and came to terms with his imperfections and sought forgiveness. It's proof that anyone can become a hero and that it's never too late to jump from the wide road to the straight and narrow. It was an absolute pleasure to write this story and I just hope you all enjoyed it as much as I did. Let me know in the comments what your favorite part was and where you would like to see it go from here. Until next time, peace out. Did you enjoy our video? Well, then be sure to check out these other great videos from the Amagi, and make sure to subscribe and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos.